Welcome to LG Transparent Conversations, the traveling podcast series powered by LG Electronics USA that brings crucial conversations about student athlete mental health directly to campuses and beyond. I'm Taylor Rooks, and today's topic is building towards balance and sustaining mental health. I'm thrilled to be joined today by our panelists, Danielle Slayton, Ryan Murphy, and Dr. Riley G. All right. Hello. My name is Taylor Rooks, and I am so happy to be here today for what I know will be another enlightening and important discussion. Welcome into LG Transparent Conversations, the traveling podcast series powered by LG Electronics USA that brings crucial conversations about student athlete mental health directly to campuses and beyond. And for our second episode of season two, we are talking about building towards balance and sustainability sustaining mental health. This episode delves into the vital importance of finding equilibrium in the lives of college athletes as we explore how managing sports, academics, and personal well-being plays a key role in positive mental and physical health. The people on this panel today have so much experience and insight, and I'm very excited to introduce them. Joining us today, we have Danielle Slayton. She's co-founder of Bay FC, soccer analyst, Olympic medalist, former U.S. Women's National Team member, and Santa Clara Broncos captain. And she's so great. I worked with her years ago, and she is absolutely amazing. Very good to see you, Danielle. Glad to be here. We've also got Ryan Murphy, USA Olympic swimmer, four-time Olympic gold medalist and UC Berkeley swim and dive team alum. Hello to you, Ryan. Hey, everyone. Great to be here. <laughs> and we've also got Dr. Riley G, Assistant Athletic Director of Counseling and Sports Psychology at Santa Clara University and former Division I volleyball player at UC Irvine. It is so nice to see you as well, Dr. Nice G. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so I think we should just dive right into the meat of this conversation and, you know, the point of this conversation. I'll start with you, Danielle. What does the word balance just mean to you? Ugh. I wish I knew, girl. I <laughs> wish I knew. Let's be clear. I, I mean, I think the reality for me is something that balance has always been a tricky word because I'm not really that great at multitasking or doing a lot of things at the same time. So when I think about balance, I actually think about being fully present with whatever it is, whatever I'm doing. It might be sports, it might be school, it might be my friends, it might be my kids now. So I'm fully present there and I'm doing that 100%. And then when I shift, where I find balance is shifting to the next thing and being fully present and 100% there. So it's me, it's kind of like jumping into one thing and then out of it, jumping into the next thing and out of it, as opposed to feeling like I'm hovering somewhere in no man's land trying to hold all of the balls in the air and feeling like I actually have balance. It's more like I'm willing to commit and go off balance here, but know that I'm not going to stay there forever and then go somewhere else later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like balance is kind of just being where your feet are. Yeah. Yeah. And like living in that moment. Ryan, do you agree that balance is a bit of a, a bit of a tricky word to dive into? 100%. Yeah. Cause I think there's, there's a level of balance that, that we all have as, as athletes. I mean, I think we're, we're all really good. If we, if we go and we have a, a really hard training session, we're going to go to the training room after and make sure that our body's recovered, that we're able to, to maintain that level of training for future days. But I think on, on the mental side, balance is a little bit more, it's a little bit more subtle. You know, I think there's, there's some weeks where definitely you are, you're mentally tasked a little bit more and you, and you have to give yourself time, time to recover from that. And that, and that could be that recovery can, can be different for everyone. And it even could be different for you at different parts of your life. So I think there's a lot of times, like if, if I have a busy week, all I need is, is a couple of, of big nights of sleep and, and then I'm feeling back to normal. But other times I, I just need to get out with friends and, and totally distract myself from, from what's going on in the day to day um, and just reset that way. Mm, absolutely. I see you nodding your head, Dr. Yes, G. <laughs> definitely. I agree with the just finding that time for all the different things that are important to you, whether that is going out with friends or getting some extra sleep. That's what balance is for me, like making sure I'm taking care of what I need to with work, but also having time with friends and family and time to watch shows I like and just be a person. I yeah. was, but I would say that that was I really struggled with that as an athlete. And mm -hmm. I thought it was hard. like rest was 
like an active thing I had to work on. I wasn't yes. good at rest. And I don't know if it was just because there was a little bit of a, um, sometimes an insecurity, like got to do the next thing. I can't be sleeping. Somebody, the next person's going to take my job. I might not make the roster if I don't do it. So, right. so for me, I had to be really intentional about rest and really intentional about taking that break because I always felt this pressure to, I got to do more. I got to do more. I can never sleep. I can never rest. But that's actually, one, not healthy <laughs> physically, mentally, in any ways. And two, at the end of the day, like it doesn't ultimately get you where you want to be or it didn't for me right. without rest. Mm -hmm. See, that's really interesting because I, I, I believe that the point that you're bringing up too is this correlation that exists somewhat between balance and pressure and the relationship between both of those things. How have either of you, you know, kind of seen how those words can blend together in some ways. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I could take it first. I mean, I think, I think, I think of pressure as as a great thing, uh, especially especially if if we're trying to to zoom out and looking at pressure over the long term. I think for for me, that's allowed that's allowed me to to have a level of strategy in in the day to day, in the week to week, and how I and how I want to deal with that pressure. So in a year like this, the pressure that I'm feeling is is I want to make another Olympic team. I want to win. I want to want to win another Olympic gold medal, and I have nine months to to try to prepare to to achieve that goal. And so I, I like the the idea of almost spreading out that pressure so that when I when I walk behind the box on the day of the Olympic final, it's not just hitting me in the face like, oh wow, we're here. Uh, what do I do now? So so I, that's kind of how how I view the the pressure side of it. Yeah, absolutely. For you, Dr. G. You have such, you know, a unique perspective and vantage point on all of this, you know, both in your lived experiences and also in your professional experience as well. So I'm curious how your idea of balance of mental health has changed from when you were a student athlete to now when you see it in this way. Yeah, I think I resonated with what Danielle was saying about balance being difficult as a student athlete. When I think back to college, volleyball was definitely the most stressful part of life of that college experience. Like, yes, I was worried about academics and the next step, but volleyball was the main stressor. And yeah, I did need to be intentional about taking time to rest and recover, do rehab, um, to heal from injuries. And so I feel like now I am better at that as I've moved out of athletics <laughs> and um, <laughs> become like a working person. But um, it was definitely difficult and it's just come with time and practice. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of times, you know, when you are talking about the balance that exists for student athletes, it does seem like it's very hectic. It seems like there's a lot of things happening all the time. You don't get rest. You're maybe always trying to juggle this, that, and the third. So when you think about the landscape right now mm -hmm. for student athletes, what are some of those more reoccurring problems that you're seeing? Yeah, I think the student athlete term, like being able to balance being a student at academically rigorous institutions while also being a high performing athlete, especially, you know, at the D1 level, um, that's a lot right there. All the demands that are on your plate for just being an athlete. And then you have to add, you know, the student piece and taking care of all of your homework while you're traveling and while you're attending practices and film sessions and team meetings. So just that piece there, and that's not even considering family stressors and stressors related to um, just any other aspect of life, your relationships, friends, family. And so also like if you have minoritized identities, like you're facing financial stressors or you're a queer student athlete, like there's just so many different things that could come up and contribute to so much being on a student athlete's plate. Mm -hmm. I think to, to piggyback on that a little bit, I mean, and also listening to what Ryan said about, about pressure, when I was playing with the national team, we used to say this all the time, pressure is a privilege. Like, people would die to be in our spot. They, they want to be here, training right on your edge and dealing with that. But, like, when you're in it, you don't, you're not thinking about those people. You know, sometimes, <laughs> I mean, you're ideally thriving in that environment, but sometimes, let's just be honest, you're just trying to survive. And I yeah. felt like when I had the ability to truly reframe the idea of pressure and and not just like pressure is a privilege. We would talk about, you know, talking about it, talking about it. I had to talk myself into actually believing it. I don't think I did. And I think repetitive practice about saying things 
to then actually convincing myself to that was true so that it manifested itself and did become true, when I can figure out how to do that and really embody this idea and reframe the idea of pressure from a negative thing to a positive thing, I feel like that's when it started to click for me. And it was more than words. It was actually how I felt about it. And then it was like, yeah, everything's going crazy. Like, this is so hard. This is awesome. Like, I feel, oh, this is exactly where I need to be. This is when I know I'm growing. Now we're going to win. We're going to win because I'm learning how to handle this or I'm learning how to deal with this. Um, but I would say it took me years to figure that out. And I wish I was young like I used to be because I am way smarter now. <laughs> like, I, if only I knew then what I know now, man, I would be Same. a great athlete. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, you know, and Dr. G, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the reasons I love hearing Danielle say that is that it seems like you're talking about tools that you learned, ways that could help you really kind of understand the world around you and how you can make it work to your advantage some. I'd love to hear more about how you honed those tools. And Ryan, if you have some tools that you have used as well to get yourself in the let's, mindset that Danielle's Come on, about. he's about to go to the Olympics. I yeah. need to hear those <laughs> yeah, tools. Yeah, what are your <laughs> tools, tools, Ryan? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, it, I think it's interesting. Like, I, I remember when I was younger and started looking at colleges, one of the things that I was told was, all right, you're going to go to school and, and you have your academics, your athletics, and your social life, and you can excel at two out of the three. Uh, and, and I remember going into school and I'm like, all right, like, I guess, I guess I'm going to pick school and, and swimming as, as those two things. But I didn't really find that to be the case. I think certainly at times you, you have to lean into to some activities more than others. Um, and I, I think there's value to, to all three of those in, in leaning in and, and being being really engaged in that piece. Um, but I think it, th there's just a level of, you have to have a level of, uh, of planning. Like when you have such a busy life, especially in college, you have to plan out, okay, I know that this week of school is going to be a little bit more busy. I know that this week of, of swimming or, or your sport is going to be a little bit more busy. This week uh, is my friend's birthday. I want to make sure I'm, I'm prioritizing that. So I think there's there's just so many different important things going on in life, and, and you just have to find your your ways to prioritize that. At what point, Ryan, do you think that you realized that mental health is just as important as physical health? That's a that's a great question. Uh, I I would say I was probably it was probably later in college, to be honest. I mean, I think when when I was in school, I, I was just so much like head <laughs> head down, just just trying to, to grind through a, a lot of things. And then I do think you, you definitely push down some, some emotions when you're, when you're doing that. And so I'd say after college, I feel like I've improved a lot in terms of framing things. If, if I get, if I get annoyed or, or angry at something, trying to just minimize the amount of time that, that I'm annoyed or angry, that's something I've really worked on. Uh, you're never gonna, you're never gonna completely eliminate an emotion. And maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but in my experience, uh, it's hard to just totally eliminate emotion, but there, I think there, there are ways to just minimize the amount of time that you're feeling some of the, the negative emotions. Mm. Dr. G, what do you hear when you yeah, hear that? Yeah, I totally agree. Yes, we're not going to get rid of stress. We're not going to get rid of anxiety or that pressure we were talking about. But it's not about getting rid of it completely. It's about coping with it, with those strategies. And also, you know, just getting to a place where, again, you were able to embrace it and use it to your advantage, use it to get you pumped up. Like, we're not going to get rid of stress. It's just, can we get to that place where we have a moderate amount of stress, that it's motivating, it pushes us to work hard, but it's not overwhelming. Mm. I, can I jump in there? So of course. I, I was hearing what Ryan was talking about, about him saying, oh, look, I kind of realized that mental health and physical health were, you know, both equally important in college. I, I'm 43. Like, we did not talk about this yeah. at all when mm -hmm. I was a player. Um, I mean, credit to the NCAA and LG for doing this because this was not part of the conversation. And honestly, like, I feel like we should even stop saying physical health and mental health. Like, it's just health. Like, mm -hmm. let's just put it all together in the same box um, because they're both equally important, both essential in my mind. And I would say that, like, I'm so grateful for sport to teach me so many things, right? You, you talk about the power of sport and youth sports and college sports. And I learned things like how to be a great teammate, how to fail and, and get back up again, how to be a good communicator, all of these things, right? But when I finally stopped playing, my, my career ended because of injury. So it ended earlier than I wanted. I wasn't happy with it. And you talked about tools. Um, I When I stopped playing, like, 
we didn't talk about an athlete transition out of sport. I, I was lost. Like I felt like um, it stuck with me like so tremendously when um, Junior Seau took his life because he talked about that. And I was like, oh my gosh, like the loss of your sport, like, like I, I felt like I got it in an instant, but I never talked about it with anyone. And I feel like I, all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, like if you get it, you don't, you just get it. You don't have to talk about it. And I felt like when I left sport, I felt like I died a little bit. I felt like I lost this thing and it wasn't fair. I remember thinking, um, and hearing a speech at graduation and people were saying, find your passion and you'll never work a day in your life. I was like, I found it. Check. Got taken away from me. Check. And I'm really not happy about it. And I don't know what to do. And I felt like, to your point, like I needed tools because the tools I started using when I felt that was all the tools I learned in sport. Suck it up. Work harder. Grind more. Well, turns out can't do that with your feelings. And I learned <laughs> that one the hard way. Yeah. And it took me a long time because I don't think I asked for help. I think I kept just trying to outwork it instead of actually like get to the root of the problem. And it was the first time I ever saw a therapist. It was the first time I ever kind of admitted, like, I didn't have the right tools and I needed different tools in my toolbox. And now, man, I got the soccer tools and these tools. Like, I'm set for life. But I feel like um, there were tools that I didn't learn in sport that I wish I had learned earlier that would helped me out of sport. Mm. I want to stay there for a minute because I was reading a blog post that you wrote a few years ago, and I thought you had a very moving and vulnerable quote that is in line with what you were just talking about that I wanted to read. You said, but I was lost, not losing, and those weren't the tools I needed. I needed patience, self-love, and support in an entirely new environment. I needed to ask for help, but I didn't know how. I was afraid of the unknown. I was grieving the loss of my sport, and I didn't know how to find my bearings in a world where I couldn't play the game at the highest level. In my mind, the only way forward through the grief and the pain was to make sure that I never looked back. When you rehear yeah. those words, I, I can tell you're re-sitting in For the sure. emotions of those. Yeah. So what are you visualizing right now? Um... Mostly, I feel proud of myself, like proud of the work that I did yeah. um, <laughs> to end up on, on the other side of that. And I don't know that I would have thought that when I was in it. Like, it didn't feel that way. Um, but I always tell people, as great as the Olympics is, as great as winning a national championship, all these things, the thing I am most proud of is learning how to not be a soccer player anymore. Because I wasn't just a girl who played soccer. I was a soccer player. And I feel like if you get to the collegiate level, most likely – that's you. Your identity is tied up in your sport. And when you lose that, I lost a little piece of my identity and I had to find it again. Um, I know that I am much more than soccer. I know I have much more to give to the world than just the fact that I can kick a soccer ball 40 yards. Um, but it took me a while to figure that out. And um, me figuring that out is my proudest work. Amazing. We are so proud of you, too. <laughs> I, I love to hear that. You know, one of my favorite things about LG and this Transparent Conversation series is that you get to hear people like Danielle talk about their vulnerabilities. You get to hear Ryan talk about the things that he is working through as well. And I feel like student athletes are saying, wait a minute. I understand this. I know exactly what they're talking about, but sometimes people aren't saying it out loud. So it's so important that this exists. And I would assume, Dr. G, that a lot of the things that these two are saying, you're very familiar with in yes, your work too. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. In what ways? I mean, definitely the loss of, of sport and that loss of identity is a huge thing. And you know, I think it's really important we talk about like staying connected to athletes after they finish their career or if they have a tough injury. Um, we want to still be there for them and offer those services to them throughout their the rest of their time at our, at our university and help them get connected to services beyond that as well, because that is a really vulnerable time um, to be experiencing a lot of emotions and a lot of transi transition and change. Um, so that is a really important time to seek support or have that available Can if I, you want that. That's amazing. Can I ask Ryan a question? Because I'm curious, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not having you trying to think about the end of your career because you still got big <laughs> right. things to do. Yeah. But, like, at what point, at, at what point while you're in swimming, are you then now, like, do you have half an eye toward the future beyond the Olympics? Like, when do you start thinking about the transition out of swimming while still making sure that you're, like, fully committed to being 
winning a gold medal while you're still swimming? Yeah, yeah, I love I love that question, and I, I really think that kind of goes that kind of goes back to the the talk about balance. I mean, for me, thinking about a future career is kind of balance. I mean, otherwise, like otherwise, I'd just be kind of like spinning my wheels on on what I want to do next, and, and just constantly worrying about that. So I think what what I've done over the past, I mean, really since the 21 Olympics was just trying to trying to meet people in in the bay area um like I, I feel i feel fortunate that i'm able to train out here and and there's there's just a really unique culture so i've gone the route of, of just trying to trying to draw inspiration from other people so who who do i see that's had a lot of success in a completely different field from me uh what are the what are the the pieces of our personalities that that might connect what are the what are the traits and the things we do on a day-to-day basis? That's pretty similar. Um, and trying to go that route in terms of placing myself of where I could potentially be successful in a future career. Ryan, I have actually heard you talk about, you know, balance and mental health before. And there was a time where you said that being an elite athlete can be very lonely and that that's why balance is important. What do you mean by that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think a, a lot of people say like, that you you make a ton of sacrifices as an elite athlete, um, and and I think that's totally true. Like you you wake up and for us the, the first thing I do every day is go to practice. So I, I wake up and and then it's right in right into the grind of of practice, and then post practice you're getting out, you're recovering, uh, you're thinking about the the following day. Each of your meals is made with uh, with swimming in mind. Your social calendar is is made with swimming in mind. Uh, so I think. Anytime you're you're trying to achieve something truly exceptional, uh, or you're trying to be a, a one of one, you definitely go to a place that's that's pretty intense. Um, and, and so I think it's just it's really important. I think it's okay to go to that place and and do that for for periods of time uh, to make yourself feel good about about your ability to achieve that goal. But I also think you need to you need to work in times where you can let yourself catch up, uh, you know, reconnect with friends. If, if you've been out and, and doing something like an altitude training camp, you're out of town for, for a month. Um, so you, so you just have to, you have to work in the times to, to be around the people that you really care about, to do some of the things outside of your sport that you're really passionate about just to, just to have that level of balance. Is loneliness something that ever affected you? And if so, how did you get out of that? I don't know that that would have been the first word that I would choose or that's that I don't know that I would have said that. Um, but to me, I feel like um, it's more like a like this is going to come across negatively, but more like a self-centeredness. Like you are constantly thinking about yourself and your body is your product. Like that's your body is your product, your vehicle, your brand now, like all mm-hmm. of these things. And so to me, it was, I mean, I, re- I remember um, so many times and what Ryan said really resonated because I was like, did I get enough sleep? Did I drink enough water? Did I have enough protein? Do I need more vegetables? Like where am I? All of these things are constantly like increasing the cortisol levels, increasing the stress levels. And you're always trying to think about that. So I felt like I was, um, I had to be diligent about like not, always thinking about myself because that's what made me successful was when I could focus on myself. And so where that balance, that's how it manifested a little bit for Mm -hmm. me and where that balance came in better was when I could then reconnect to people and like my grounding, you know, I call it my, like my personal board of directors to help me stay to who I was and actually like get out of my own way in my own head sometimes. Definitely. And that speaks to something that is very important to LG, which is community, having that community around you, that support system around you. What power exists in making sure that that community around you is correct? Yeah, I think that is so important. Like when I hear Ryan talking about that, it's like, how many people understand that experience of getting up in the morning, going straight to practice and having every decision revolve around your sport? Like it is so nice to have other people around you who understand that and who are also doing that in their sport and trying to achieve something great. Um, And, you know, this is also why sports psychologists exist because it's, I think it's really powerful to go see a therapist who also understands that and who has had that experience. Um, again, just to to have that baseline level of understanding of what it's like to be an athlete. Um, But yeah, I think community is huge to be able to turn to others for support and 
just again have a shared experience that people understand help it feel a little less lonely yeah why was it so important for you to get into this specific line of work yeah as I spoke about with my college experience volleyball was the main stressor and um as I was thinking about what I wanted to do next, um, we had a sports psychologist that worked with our team. Actually, he was on this podcast as well, Dr. Parham from LMU. Um, and he worked with our team. And I just saw that really how much we were all affected by the stressors related to our sport. And so I knew I wanted to be a therapist, but not just a therapist in general. But like I saw that athletes needed this specific support and that they were facing a lot of mental health issues, myself included, like everyone around me. And um, I just felt like this would be a really great way to work with that community and kind of give back to that group of, of folks. I love that. Absolutely. And it's I can tell it is such a passion of yours. So that's really beautiful. And Ryan, when you hear that, I mean, how encouraging is it for you to see the ways, the leaps and bounds that we have taken to make sure that student athletes feel supported? And I know there is so much more we have to do, but that has to feel, you know, encouraging. What was it like? For you in school, did somebody like Dr. G exist? Uh, he, no, I mean, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, but I didn't, I wasn't utilizing someone one-on-one. -on -one. I would say my junior year of college, we had a, a sports psychologist come in and talk to our whole team. Um, Ken Revisa, who's unfortunately passed away now, but he, he's done a lot of work with, with MLB teams with Joe Madden. So he's with the Cubs for a while. Um, and, and he was, he was incredible. And, and I think that just the way that he talked really resonated with our group. Um, and, and he just, yeah, he gave us really good tools to think about. Like when you're going behind the, when you're going behind the box for a huge race, every time I go behind the box, now I have a focal point in the arena. The first time I go into that, that pool, I find my focal point and that, that just centers me back on, on what needs to happen. And another, another tool that he gave us that, that I found really helpful is when you get nervous and, and the adrenaline starts going, your mind speeds up as well. And so it's harder to, it's harder to think clearly, but you could always remember three things. And so that's, that's something that, that I thought was, was incredible and, and something that I use on, on a daily basis. Um, and, and then he, he just had, he had incredible one-liners and he, he would say things like, are you that bad that you need to feel great in order to be good? And, and the answer is no, like some days you're going to show up and, and you're not, you're not going to be feeling 100%, but you have to maximize, you give what you can on, on those days. And, and if you do that every day, then, you know, you're going to be in a really good spot. So yeah, I think he, he just did a really good job of simplifying things for us. I love that. I love that quote. Damn. One of the one of the tools that um, our sports psychologist Colleen Hacker um, with the women's national team. I always f find this story funny. I haven't thought about it in a while too. But we used to always talk about you know controlling what you can control. Right. You might not be able to control your emotions, but you can control the replacement or the thought that replaces them, or how you react to them, or you know lots of things. Um, and so we used to use the concept of you know putting it in the parking lot. Sometimes you hear people like flush it or whatever. Well, we use the concept of you know put it, park it. Um, and this idea that like, you know, you go to the mall and, or you go wherever and you park your car and when you're in the mall, you're not thinking about where's my car, where's my car. Maybe some, if I had like a nice Tesla or something, maybe I would be, but <laughs> I don't, um, you know, you're doing what you got to do. And yeah. then when you come back out, then you think, okay, where's my car? So same thing. You make a mistake. You, you, something's not going well. Okay. Park it go play the game, do what you got to do, and then come back to it and address it later. So unlike flushing it, like, no, we actually have to deal with it. We have to address it. We have to come back to it. But we're not going to deal with it right now because right now we have to go play soccer. So it was the gold medal game of, um, of the Olympics in Sydney. And Colleen tells this story much better than I do, but a starter on our team is having a bad day, right? Um, she forgot her jersey. They didn't have the right food at pregame. Like, all of the things, the family distractions, all of these things. Like, you don't love to have that at the gold medal game of the Olympics, right? You want everything to be flying and smoothing. And um, so she comes over and storms over and finds Colleen, like, right before kickoff, which... Again, probably never a good sign if somebody's like <laughs> beelining for the sports psychologist. But she's like, Colleen, this is going on and this is going on and da 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 da. -da. And she's like, has her laundry list of things. And Colleen um, was like, you know what you got to do? We've practiced this 
you got to park it. She goes, Colleen, the parking lot is bleeping full. <laughs> <laughs> and Colleen in her... A real feeling. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like, talk about... You know what that feeling is, yeah. right? And Colleen in her infinite wisdom says something like, well, looks like you got to build a parking deck. You build that deck real quick and you put that car up there and then go... And she played a wonderful game, right? Like, mm-hmm. and... Um, so, it, like, I feel like those are, like, the little tools and the little stories that even stick with me, right? Like, 20-some-odd years later, um, and tools that I even still use to this day um, in my life in, you know, infinite, different, myriad ways. Yeah, that is such a good story that is absolutely <laughs> going to help somebody. Because when your parking lot is full, right, what are some things you can do? Oh, okay. Well, First thing that comes to mind is maybe just finding a place or a way to empty that parking lot, like whether that is in therapy or you need to talk to someone, let it out, or even on your own, maybe you spend some time jotting down or like just pre-writing about what's going on so you can have a way to let it out and just like take the pressure down a notch and really just try to clear out that parking lot a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's so important. You know, life is really, really good with optimism. That is something that LG stresses a lot. So Danielle, tell me how the power of optimism has positively affected your life. Oh, goodness. That's a hard question. Um, I, I think one of the things that I try to, to practice and that gives me an optimistic viewpoint of life is just really practicing gratitude. Um, and every morning when I wake up in the morning, I, you know, before my two little kids jump on me and then just, you know, the world gets crazy. Um, but every day before I wake up, I try to, you know, just pause for a minute, even if it's just a minute, like ahead of my cold cup of coffee, cause I couldn't drink it fast <laughs> enough. Um, and just what am I grateful for today? Right. And sometimes honestly on hard days, it might just be I am up and my two feet are on the ground (laughs) and that is all that I like can muster up. And some days like I just feel this wealth of gratitude. So I try to take a pause in the morning and at night before I go to bed. Um, It's a little amount of time that I feel like I can carve out for myself, even if it's just 30 seconds here and there um, to just pause, be grateful. And that tends to like fill my cup and make me feel optimistic about what is ahead. Beautiful. What about you, Ryan? How has optimism been a tool in your life? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's super important. Now, I think the way that I think about it is, I mean, really in, in the short term and the day to day, there are a lot of things that aren't in your control. You can't really help how you, how you wake up in the morning, how you're feeling, but over the long term, there's a lot more that's in your control. You have the ability to, um, you know, to, to make progress towards a goal over the long term. And so I've always had a, I've always definitely had a long-term mindset. And, and I think that allows me to, to stay really optimistic. That's great. You know, for you, Dr. G, LG's really intentional about highlighting diverse voices, diverse experiences. And I feel like mental health is so layered that that almost has to always be at the forefront, that everyone's experience is different, that different kinds of people feel things differently. Mm -hmm. How do those societal pressures affect individuals differently? And why is it important to know that this isn't a one size fits all approach for everyone? Yeah. I think those factors affect people in an infinite amount of ways. Like there are so many things that are playing into someone's experience, why they're feeling the way that they feel. Um, Someone makes a comment to them and why they take it a certain way. Like there's so many different things that play into that all day, every day. And it's just making space for whatever that person's experience is and being able to name the different identities or different experiences that maybe are coming into the picture, but just acknowledging that it is different for everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, I was not very good at being vulnerable and something that helped me with that is going to therapy. Now I feel a lot better and more comfortable being open with how I feel about things when times are hard, when I'm sad, knowing that it's okay to talk about my emotions. So I'd love to hear from you two who seem to have such a good grasp of the power of vulnerability and why that can help you how you got to that point, like how you knew that it was okay to fully show up as you. Because I'm sure somebody else is listening to this probably felt the same way about it as I did, which was that this is really hard (laughs) to talk about myself in these ways. 
I was nervous coming into this conversation. I was like, oh, I got it. What time is this? What time do I have to do it? Like, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm also like slightly terrified about what this, where this conversation is going to lead. But like, even today is an example of it, right? Like you sit in conversation with people. We talk about this and you realize, at least for me, one, I'm not alone, right? I, if I am going through this, there's probably someone else in the world of how many be, are 7 billion people now that has probably experienced the same thing. And so um, I also think, too, like what I remind myself is when I'm being vulnerable, it feels very scary or it feels um, really hard. But then when I see other people do it, like the first instinct I have is, oh, my God, that's so brave. Thank you for sharing. Like, and I need to have the same conversation with myself that I would have with somebody else who would do that. And I, for some reason, like it would, I would treat myself like, oh, well, I'm different. No, I'm not different. So for me, I think seeing other people do it, um, and that's to your point about being in community and having these conversations and, and being confident enough to kind of step into your own skin um, is cer- certainly very important. I don't think, though, realize, like really, I would probably say it's probably been in the last – three years, and honestly, after the killing of Joy- George Floyd was when I, I really started to be like, oh, no, no, oh, maybe maybe people who look like me, like people actually want to hear what we have to say. And so for me, like that whole like weird time uh, of figuring out, like my voice all of a sudden, I knew my voice mattered, but it didn't really feel like it mattered, but now I'm thinking it matters. And figuring all of that out has been a really interesting journey for me over the last three years. But I feel like these last three years has honestly too helped me realize that like I have a voice at the table. It's part of why, why I'm helping to start this women's football club here, right? Like no, my voice at the table in decision-making matters and my experience matters and having that breadth of diversity at the table is really, really important for us to succeed and thrive as a community, as a soccer club um, and as a country, I think. Yeah. You know, I really enjoy hearing your perspective on this because so many of the things that you're saying are recent revelations. Yeah. And that's really cool because it's like you never stop growing and you never stop learning about yourself. Have you found joy in that? Yeah. I mean, I I come from a family of teachers, right? Like, so we're lifelong learners. We keep learning stuff. Um, (laughs) And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, if you're green, you're growing. If you're ripe you're rotten so let's just keep growing (laughs) (laughs) Ryan what about for you how are you making sure you know every day you you understand that that being vulnerable is a superpower and also that you're learning about yourself through helping others with your vulnerability yeah yeah it's a great question I mean I I think the at, at its core I think the most important thing for me is just to realize that that all emotions I'm feeling are valid um and and I think once I once I'm comfortable with just like recognizing the emotion that's kind of step one and then step two is like okay if i don't really enjoy that emotion then working on 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 techniques to to minimize the amount of time i'm I'm feeling it and i think with with the people around you i think it's just good to it's just good to check in every once in a while like I, i think one thing that that i try to do in in, in my marriage and, and really internally as well is, is just practice extreme honesty with each other. Um, and I think at, at the end of the day, like if you're, if you're in a, if you're in a group or you take a marriage, both, both sides of that want the, want this thing to be incredible. And, and so there's, there's things that you might, you might have to adjust about yourself in order to, to make them feel, feel better about the relationship. Um, and then the same goes in, in terms of your own personal journey. Like you, if you, if you have to change things about yourself, you can, you can get started on that process any day. Uh, and, and so just giving yourself the space to, to realize, okay, like maybe this is something I need to work on. Um, and, and I'm going to work on it. I, I just think that's really important. Definitely. You know, Dr. G, the title of this episode is sustaining mental health. And I feel like that sustaining word is really important because it isn't just about, you know, taking that first step for your mental health. It's how can you make sure you're taking those steps always so that it is a sustainable environment for you. What advice do you have for people that need to make sure that this is a lifelong thing that they are looking to tackle? Yeah. Taking that stance Danielle was talking about as being a lifelong learner and realizing that this is going to be a lifelong process. Things are going to happen. Stressors are going to come up. And 
it's okay to have to cope with those things over and over and over again or as different things come up. Um, and there's also practices that you can put into place each day, like gratitude and uh, really reflecting on that. Also just being intentional about how you're spending your time, making time for self-care or to honor other parts of yourself outside of being a student or an athlete, and really just building that practice of taking care of yourself over time. Amazing. This is for all of you, but I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. G. What do you want this conversation to mean to someone? I want it to show that it's okay to talk about these things, definitely. And that, you know, we've all, as student athletes, had these experiences where, you know, times were tough and um, it is a, it's a tough role to have, to be a student athlete and compete at a high level. And it's okay if that feels hard and it's okay to also ask for support or seek support from others. And um, there are people out there that want to help. I think the thing that's sticking with me or that's coming up for me right now is just um, when I look at student athletes today and I think back on when I was a student athlete, um, life doesn't get easier. Like, sorry to break it to you. It doesn't get easier. Preach. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but what it does, if, if you're willing to have these conversations, if you're willing to reflect, if you're willing to do these things, you get a lot better at handling the hard. And so in that sense, it does get easier, right? Like I have more tools. I know where I can go. I am learning different things about myself and about the world that do make it easier. Life doesn't get easier, but I get better at dealing with it. Mm -hmm. Like life isn't getting easier, but with the tools, it can get easier for you based on mm -hmm. how you are handling it yeah. and dealing with yeah, it. Yeah, you just handle the hard better. Absolutely. Absolutely. What about you, Ryan? What would you like someone to take from this conversation? I think like in, in terms of, student athletes, we, we do so much to, to build up our bodies. And, and I think there's, there's definitely a ton of value in doing the same thing, working on the mental side, how to frame things, how to frame a perceived success or a perceived disappointment um, and, and leaning on the people around you. I, I think having a good network of people around you is, is so important um, and, and just being comfortable, being comfortable with what you're feeling. That is completely valid. Um, and you can lean into that as well. Amazing. Okay, well, I want to end on this, talking about balance. Tell me what makes you all happy outside of your work and outside of your sport. Where do you find that happy balance, Danielle? Oh, I mean, my kids right now. So I have a, a three-and-a-half-year-old and a, a one-year-old. Um, and uh, I was thinking Johnny, my oldest, is really into um, planes right now, like Oddly, Ooh. into planes. We're right by the San Jose <laughs> airport here. Um, we don't live too far, so we see the airplanes. And the other day, he woke up. Um, he said, uh, Mommy, I have to go to new to work in New Zealand. Excuse me? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to take an Airbus A380, and I'm going <laughs> to fly on British Airways, and I'm going to go to London and then New Zealand. And you can't come. I'll be back on Friday. And so that is precious. <laughs> okay. like, first of all, when did you get grown? And two... You're hilarious. So I think um, <laughs> just finding the joy in in children right now. Uh, I'm in it, right? And it's chaos. And, you know, there's poop over here and throw up over there. And it's just a nightmare <laughs> in so many ways. But it's also just, like, the best thing ever. And so being comfortable sitting in that space right now and just laughing through it all brings me a ton of joy right now. Oh, oh my <laughs> gosh. We love it. New Zealand. He's on the way. New Zealand. <laughs> yeah. I can't come, though. So I guess I'll see him <laughs> He'll send you back. a postcard. <laughs> yeah. Like all the things. <laughs> Dr. G, what mm -hmm. makes you happy? the outside of work and sport. Yeah, uh, I agree. Similar type of thing, but family and um, just spending time with the people I care about and, you know, getting to do new experiences, even just something simple like going to try a new restaurant with the people I love. Mm -hmm. Like, just keep it simple and spend time with those people and build memories. Yeah, it really is the little things for sure. What about for you, Ryan? Oh, you, you nailed that answer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it, it really is. It really is like the people that you're with, the things that the things that you're doing, learning new things. Those are those are all incredible. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of LG Transparent Conversations. For more episodes and to catch up on season one, check out LG Transparent Conversations on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or at lg.com slash US slash transparent dash conversations. LG, life's good. <laughs> <laughs>